you're looking good and it feels good to be with you this morning. Hello, I'm Kendall Bryan Hunter, author of this book, Consider My Servant Job. And this is Come Follow Me, Get to the Point. Good, it stayed put. This is Get to the Point, where I always show up, I always come prepared, we never take roll, and it's bring your own refreshments. Yes, leftover Easter candy. So, you probably saw in the news that the Gallup poll and uh, the church came out at the top of the dog pile and attendance, so it's about 67%. And it's kind of funny how that's uh, getting passed around. One of the news sources, uh, which is uh, Salem Radio News, painted a very dismal picture. All attendance is down all around everywhere, which is true, but they didn't mention that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the top of the dog pile. We're king of the hill. Even though the attendance is going down, we're the ones on top. Uh, that's that's interesting. It's uh, significant. Uh, you ask yourself why that is. And uh, also, as we're for starting to celebrate Passion Week, Holy Week, and to turning to our uh, Christian cousins, which are lowering in attendance, why we should turn to our Christian cousins who have worse attendance at church for guidance is, of course, uh, kind of a little bit of a mystery to me. You probably heard that uh, former member David Archuleta. If you're millennial Gen Z, you probably saw him on the face-to-face. -face. He's now left the church, come out uh, LGBTQ, and he wrote a song called Hell Together and released a little video about the uh, things he's doing since he left the church. So I didn't play the music because I don't want the earworm, but I did read the lyrics. So yeah, you can search them on the internet, have your chat bot and look them up. Uh, Joseph Smith Manual. Chapter 18 says, What is the damnation of hell? To go to that society with <clears throat> and to go with that society who have not obeyed his commandments. Chapter 18 of the Joseph Smith Manual. This illustrates another problem is that sometimes in the church we forget what our message is. In the Book of Mormon, Jesus Christ said, I am the light which you should hold up. And sometimes we start focusing on celebrities and members as opposed to Jesus Christ. Um, Meet the Mormons is a good example of that. That was a video designed to create social converts. Show up to our church, and here's the cool people you get to hang out with. It's no different than Adam Sandler's Hanukkah song, but it just doesn't have a good beat, and you can't dance to it. Uh, questions about the cross. Uh, I had some excitement this week, and on my X account, I have another one that focuses on uh, specifically more church stuff as opposed to my one that's under my name, which is a general stuff, and there's some questions about... Uh, should members use the cross? So I put three links in. One is to President Hinckley's uh, home teaching lesson back from April 2005, where he talks about that. Um, the uh, gospel topics has a question, has an entry on the cross, and also have a link to the Encyclopedia of the Incorrect Name of the Church, the Encyclopedia of Mormonism, and uh, its entry on the cross, which was written by Roger Keller, who was a BYU professor who was a convert. He was a Protestant minister, converted, and later became a BYU professor of religion. I took a class from him, so it's kind of inter interesting to read. Um, Howard W. Hunter said the temple is a great symbol of our membership. So instead of taking crosses, let's follow the teachings of President Howard W. Hunter and President Gordon B. Hinckley and focus on the temple and not the cross. So today's theme is... Jacob, the anxious prophet. And it begins, it starts out with one of those small colophons. In the older editions, it was the italicized headings. Now they're out of italics because that's ancient writing, where he gives a summary of his book. And he talks about his preaching, talks about his contending with a person, and then the history. And that's a great outline of the book, seven chapters. The first one through six are about um, preaching the gospel. And chapter seven talks about Sherem, and also rounds out the history. And this book starts talking about the handoff, where there's a division, the separation of church and state, where you have the kings, and the kings adopt the throne name of Nephi. Now, something happened where they stopped doing that, so you get King Mosiah and Benjamin. But they may have kept it on as sort of a ritual name, but it wasn't recorded. So that's something we're missing from 116 pages about. That might explain what happened, is why the kings stopped using the name of Nephi. But that's the beginning of the uh, Nephi dynasty. We, we don't know who... Uh, King Nephi II it was, don't know anything about him or his descendants. Um, the, the other one is the small plates, and that's what we're reading right now, get passed along the prophetic line. 
So the prophetic line is the descendants of uh, Nephi's brother, Jacob. And that's the esoteric one where it contains uh, spiritual experiences, doctrinally rich. It's an incredible read. Some of the most interesting stuff in the Book of Mormon are in there, uh, theologically rich. Um, it kind of reminds us in our dispensation, um, due to stuff that happened in Nauvoo, Joseph Smith's children, for the most part, aren't in the church. Uh, that has to do with the community of Christ, the reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Um, I, I talked a little bit about that in a previous podcast about the animosity. And his brother Hiram stayed with the church. I think that's a, an interesting parallel. I don't know what the significance is. But, uh, yeah, I think the last general authority who was related to uh, Hiram Smith was President M. Russell Ballard, who recently died. Then, in this chapter, you get an interesting historical call that as Jacob's writing, he says, okay, guys, I'm writing, you have the seven tribes of uh, Lehi, but just to make things easier in writing, I'm just going to call them Nephites and Lamanites, although you do have the uh, ethnic and the tribal distinctions are important. The Nephites are just not getting recorded here. You know, the interesting one to pay attention to is the tribe of Zan um, um Zorab, excuse me, <laughs> that, a little brain skip, <laughs> skip there. With Zoram, that tribe tends to maintain its distinction, as you read in the Book of Alma. They had very good generals. Um, they apostatized, and uh, they remained. They, they talked about the history of impressment. Like I said, I think the interesting question about Zoram was, Zoram a free man that Nephi enslaved, or was Zoram a slave to Laban that Nephi freed? And you need to sort that out on your own. But just think about that. Um, you also have later on with the uh, Lamanites and Nephites, you have the Mulekites that get absorbed into the Nephites. I'll talk a little bit about that when we get to it later on in the Book of Mormon, probably in uh, next week. So anxiety, that word appears three times in this book, but it jumps out at you. So it feels like it's been repeated more times, like in The Princess Bride and Inconceivable. The word anxiety means worry, dread, apprehension, Hebrew da'og. Has this idea of uh, dividing, like you go to pieces, as we say in English, a song by uh, some uh, British singers called I Go to Pieces, which I think was written by Paul McCartney, and two of the Beatles didn't sing that one. Um, and Latin uh, anxiety it comes from the word ango, which means to constrict, like the tightening of a throat. You know, you're, you're limited, you're not, you're in a straight jacket, ango, constriction, strangling hands around your neck. The Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard wrote a book called Concept of Anxiety. And he, the point of the book he made was that freedom gives us the sense of dread because you're responsible for your actions. That's why people vote for totalitarian governments and they want someone else to take care of them, to make all the complex decisions of life so they can spend all the time watching Taylor Swift videos. But he described it like freedom standing on the edge of a cliff or your toes are curling over the edge of a cliff and you're looking down and you have that sense of dread. And not sure exactly what Jacob had in mind, but he is very conscientious about things that he's taking this calling seriously. It's not casual, flippant, something that you work in between uh, uh, your, your, your golfing trips. And he talks about in this chapter, getting inspiration for his calling, getting his errand from the Lord. That's a term we don't use anymore. We used to use it, but we stopped using it, and maybe we need to bring that back. Um, that he's going to the temple and inquiring of the Lord. Um, this contrast when someone's just showing up to a church meeting, a presidency meeting, and, hey, this is the last podcast I heard. Let's just do what they said. Or I heard about this in this other ward, and let's just do what they're doing and make it over, make us uh, our word, do what they're doing over there. Now, that'd be a healthy part of the discussion process, but you have to ask God what's going on. A good example of that is in the Old Testament when uh, Nathaniel and David wanted to build a temple. Nathaniel gave the go-ahead, and then God had to say, wait a second, I don't want, this, this is not my plan. I want Solomon to build the temple, so back off on it. And we had a similar incident. It's in our dispensation with the Manti Temple. They wanted to renovate it, change it around, and... Uh, God had intervened and said, no, I want a temple in Ephraim. That's my plan. So uh, back off. Make sure you're doing You're not getting caught up in the hysterics or the emotion of the moment, the frenzy. Make sure that this is uh, a sense of euphoria or consensus may not necessarily be revelation. He makes a point about sins being upon your head if we don't magnify our calling, is that when we accept a calling and 
when's the last time you heard this taught in a priesthood meeting? When you accept a calling, you, you get blood put in upon your soul, that you have a responsibility. And if you horse around with the calling, uh, mishandle church funds, jerk people around, flip and slipshod, basing your uh, calling on podcast rather than the church handbook, going to Reddit instead of the church handbook. There's going to be responsibility because you're just not going to work your calling the way it should. The John Taylor Manual, page 164, said, If you do not magnify your callings, God will hold you responsible for those whom you might have saved. Have you done your duty? This is interesting because I bring this up because I, I got released from a teaching calling and the bishop who released me, uh, one of the criticisms he had is he didn't want me to correct people or tell people they were wrong. So if I'm, I'm a teacher and someone's believing something that really isn't gospel truth, um, I was asked to keep quiet about that. And that, that's kind of an interesting dynamic why someone would want me to keep quiet if something's true. And this, this is stuff I could point from the scriptures. So... Something to think about, something I definitely have to think about. And so why the anxiety is that we have two problems going on in the Nephite society right now. It's polygamy and riches. So chapter two, that's the Miami Vice chapter. That's the, uh, the, the law and order chapter where we get into the crimes and vice squad, bunko. And Nephi, as uh, Jacob explains, excuse me, as Jacob explains, the problem is they're going around digging mines, digging up gold. And this is an argument for the South American uh, origin of the South or Central American origin of the Book of Mormon. You had to have really good mines in the area, an abundance of ore. People were getting rich off the mining. They're buying expensive clothing and they're persecuting the poor. Which, of course, same thing goes on nowadays. And so Jacob teaches, you know, before you seek riches, seek God. When you get riches, use it to do the work of God. Now, how exactly that applies to you on a personal level, that's up to personal revelation, but that's the general principle. Uh, the second one is polygamy. And this gets a little, this is a little sick, uh, interesting session because it's tied with the division between our church and the community of Christ. Um, you understand that Emma, Emma's approach to polygamy, Emma Smith's pr approach was no, yes, no, no, heck no. And they had an issue about denying that polygamy went on, whereas we have a lot of Joseph Smith's wives. Uh, Eliza Snow said, yeah, I was married to Joseph Smith as a plural wife. And uh, none of them ever backed off on that. Um, so that's a, that, that's a thing. And there's a caveat in verse 30 says, you know, if the Lord wants to raise up a righteous seed, and that's really what it's about is building up families, preparing bodies for a lot of spirits, sending them to righteous families. Um, one of... Uh, he, I think it was Heber C. Kimball's wife, and the source of this is Spencer W. Kimball's first biography. Heber C. Kimball's wife said, look, I'm marrying a righteous husband, uh, Heber C. Kimball, and so I'm willing to put up with polygamy in order to be married to him. Um, as you read this, you, you get this revelation, these um, uh, pericopes are things where the Lord is speaking in the first person to Jacob, or he's recording a revelation. It's a little bit like you read in Mosiah 26 about the question about how to do apostate members. Do you excommunicate them, leave them the church, and get these this revelation from the Lord? And Jacob seems to be quoting this revelation that he got from the Lord, although he doesn't expressly state it. Also, um, uh, chapter 3, verse 5 suggests that there may have been a commandment from Lehi about polygamy. So there's just stuff missing here. And... Um, as Jacob's, uh, so it's not kind of cut as dry as some people may, because I, uh, yeah, we don't do this unless the Lord commands it, and that's the uh, general operating procedure. Um, there's also talk about misplaced arrows and friendly fire that uh, Jacob was concerned about hurting people, that they're innocent bystanders as he's as he's talking about these problems. Yeah, the wives and the children just didn't need to hear it. He's concerned about their feelings, so. That's that. That's Miami Vice chapter. Jacob 3 is a pro-Lamanite chapter. And it's like in the Book of Mormon, Mosiah 10 and Helan 15 are very pro-Lamanite. They talk about the blessings upon the Lamanites. And Jacob points out is, yeah, these Lamanites aren't practicing polygamy. They're taking care of their families, and you're doing worse than them. I mean, you hate them because, you know, they don't have the gospel, but, you know, they're doing a better job than you are. There's issues of colorism. You know, don't revile them for their dark skins. You're making fun of them because they have a dark skin. Now, what exactly that means biologically and physiological, I don't know. We've had different theories and different understandings over time and some corrections, but uh, we don't have pictures. We don't have DNA sequences. So 
what that exactly means, but it was clearly a colorism phenomenon. And we're, we're dealing with that issue nowadays. Um, Jacob makes this uh, prophecy. And the time, speedily cometh, the, the time speedily cometh that except you repent, they, the Lamanites, shall possess the land of your inheritance. And the Lord God will lead, lead away the righteous out from among you. That's uh, 3, 4. Um, that gets fulfilled in Omni 1. 5.11, where Mosiah the first leads the Nephites out of, out of it, and that's where they encounter the Mulekites. So that's that. He preaches, and there's more going on that's not recorded, but that's really what needed to be recorded and preserved for us in our day. Polygamy and uh, riches. So Jacob 4 talks about Jesus Christ. Um, they talk about the power of faith, how they get revelations, and this puzzling verse, that the trees obey them. What does that mean? You're, you're probably getting pictures of Lord of the Rings with the tree ants, uh, trees walking around. Um, it's like with Mount Zarin, the Book of Ether. We have it recorded, alluded to, we just don't understand the circumstances, but it's interesting to think about. It talks about the trees obeying them and getting revelation, seeing things as they really are. That's a big question. How does reality really work? You have different notions and you have authorities but what's really going on? How does reality work? That's that's the big question. And you get that, you understand that by revelation, like Moses chapter one. Jacob talks about the laws of Moses, the law of Moses, uh, Abraham and Isaac, the sacrifice. And he asks this great rhetorical question, for why not speak of the atonement of Christ and attain to a perfect knowledge of him as to attain to the knowledge of a resurrection in the world to come? So it's a rhetorical question, shifting the burden. Um, What's going on in our classes? Uh, are our presidency meetings so busy calendaring and planning activities that we're not talking about Christ or spiritual needs? Yeah, that goes on, and uh, we need to fix that. This chapter concludes with a setup for the uh, allegory of the olive tree, which we'll discuss next week. Which, interesting, Wilfred Woodruff, greatest missionary of this dispensation, preached from this uh, chapter. When I'm reading his journals right now, and he says, yeah, preached uh, on the parable of the vineyard from the in Zenus and uh, maybe we need to start doing that as missionaries I mean it certainly worked for him so the question uh, as he's winding down and making this transition looking beyond the mark people who despise plainness um, that's a seduction that high priests have so I, I, I'm a high priest so this is a friendly fire people need to show off their intelligence people who uh want to impress people with the, all this uh, odd stuff. Richard G. Scott talked about this. Uh, he was an apostle who passed on. He said, I visited the Sunday school the Sunday school class in our ward, this would be in Utah, where a very well-educated teacher presented his lesson. That experience was striking contrast to the one I enjoyed in the priesthood meeting where he had a humble teacher in Mexico. It seemed to me that the instructor had purposely chosen obscure references and unusual examples to illustrate the principles of the lesson. I had the distinct impression that this instructor was using the teaching opportunity to impress the class with his vast store of knowledge. At any rate, he certainly did not seem as intent on communicating the principles as he had as had the humble priesthood leader. October 2009. Yeah, this stuff goes on, you know. Uh, greed, pride, showing off our intelligence, looking beyond the mark. This is relevant as today's newspaper. So those are the four chapters. Here's the Christ quotient. Um, are we getting our errand from the Lord? Are we getting, getting it from our podcast? Well, this is what we did in my last ward. So of course it's going to work perfectly in this ward. I have yet to see that happen because the ward is a different ward with different people. You have a question of keys. The keys from the previous ward don't apply to the keys or the uh, priesthood key holder in this ward. Uh, you're, you're just burglarizing another ward and trying to bring it into your ward? Or, or, or your, is your errand from the Lord from your political party's agenda? Are you just incorporating and slavishly and mindlessly and zombie-like following social trends uh, instead of uh, following Jesus Christ in, in his teachings? The, the gospel is really plain. It's in their scriptures. Uh, Joseph Smith translation clarifies the Bible. There's no confusion. confusion. Dangers of sex and money. So what's your hum humility strategy? How can you be humble like Christ in the matters of money? You know, are your finances under control? Have you eliminated your debt? Once you get rid of 
once you zero out your credit card, pay off your student loans, you'll be blown away at how rich you become. Money just because you start keeping your money. What's your anti-pornography strategy? Is there such a thing as cyber polygamy? <clears throat> cyber polygamy. Think about that term. Cyber polygamy. C cyber concubines. Uh, workplace polygamy. Your, your, your work wife. It's easy. Pray to have charity for people at work. Pray to have fidelity and uh, chastity and uh, read the scriptures every day and I'll, I'll take care of you. Um, building generational testimony as we hand off to the new generation. Are we expecting the social and cultural pressure and state-sponsored schools to take care of creating testimony in your children? Because testimonies just don't happen. It's intentional work. Um, how are you protecting your children from renegade pundits? Um, what if you were, when you were young, you saw the David Archuleta face-to-face, -face, and now he's, he's out of the church and uh, talking about his sexual escapades on social media? What are you doing to protect your children? What are you doing to protect yourself? Lastly, do we understand the basics of Christ's atonement? Are we reading the scriptures? You know, are we taking notes and working this out on your own? Or are you dependent upon podcasters? You know, you sat in Sunday school. Well, the podcaster I heard said this. Oh, yeah, well, my podcaster said that. Well, what did the Holy Ghost tell you? Uh, is this church holy initiative, uh, Holy Week initiative just more over-programming? Are we relying upon apostate sources to strengthen our faith? Their creeds are an abomination. Uh, there's a danger of, as you try to make uh, Easter more Christmas-like, there's a danger of looking beyond the mark. So we have problems with Christmas, which you always talk about. Now we're going to have to start talking about problems with over-programming Easter. Because we're looking beyond the mark. And what's the mark? The mark is Jesus Christ. And that's the point. And I testify of that.